Now, here's your host for the Career Clinic, Maureen Anderson. My guest on the Career Clinic today and the author of High Performance Ethics and Timeless Principles for Next Generation Leadership. And Daryl and I welcome you back to the program, Jim. First, Jim, this is not only a book, it's an online course. You can take it for credit for what? Yes, uh, we have this available. Actually, uh, if people will go to our website, lumen.co, that's L-U-M-A-N dot C-O, and click on the online program uh, tab, they will find both a 60-minute presentation that I did to a large group uh, on the 10 key principles of being a high-performance ethics person. Uh, and then they can also uh, click on the course. Uh, we have a full uh, online asynchronous course that you can take for CEU credit. It's a fully accredited course. And uh, there you get to get into a little bit more uh, in-depth work uh, on this. Ethics as defined, I think, is doing the right thing. Is that how you would define it? Yeah, and I think uh, we tried to tie this together, Maureen, with this whole idea of performance. You know, there's a lot of things out there on performance, and there's some things out there on ethics. Uh, but we really wanted to tie the two together and really is very much in line with your uh, mission and direction that, you know, you can live a passionate powerful, successful life, and it can also be a very ethical life as well. And, in fact, you can not only do right and do well, you can do well by doing right. Uh, so we think uh, that living this way with these high-performance ethics, uh, we call them also everyday ethics, is a way to live both a passionate life in your career and your work uh, and also to live without regret, which is, I know, one of the wonderful points that you talk about. So, yeah, it's, it's a matter of really picking and doing uh, the right thing, and the way I've summarized it for a lot of folks is it's never the wrong time to do the right thing. Uh, whatever the issue is, I've had people say that through the years. I've heard people in meetings, is this the right time to tell our customers the truth? Is this the right time to do this or that? And I think if you just operate with the principle, it's never the wrong time to do the right thing, uh, you're going to be able to really live a very powerful, effective life. I think you're going to get promoted in the work that you're doing and you are going to be able to look in the mirror in the morning and feel good about yourself. Why is it then that so many of us think of high performance and ethical behavior as inversely proportional? Is it just what we you hear know, in the news? It's a, great question. <laughs> it's a great question, and I think that, you know, we see so much in, in business and life and even in not-for-profits and, uh, you know, government groups and so on, so much of a push that we've got to get more work out and we've got to hit results and management by objectives and, performance management and everything, so we just get that drill. And I think that at times in organizations, and we've seen a lot of organizations the last 10 years that have ethical outages, uh, it's very possible <laughs> to push that too much without keeping this idea of ethics in line with the two, uh, that you end up just shoving that into the background, and all of a sudden the whole goal becomes performance, and then it's easy to start cutting corners. And, you know, I know this uh, – this truth that I'm going to tell here would really probably benefit the company, but it's going to hurt my position or my department in the short run, so I think I'll just bury it. And it's all, it becomes about the numbers rather than about the numbers plus doing the right thing. And the real interesting thing, Maureen, is the truth always comes out anyway. Bad ethics always come out anyway. Uh, so sacrificing ethics for performance, which is often what happens, uh, is really not only bad for ethics and living rightly, but it's really bad for performance, too. And companies and organizations that just don't have good everyday ethics, um, they might get some short-term boost out of that, but in the long term, they're going to have the bricks falling on top of their head. I know one thing. Ethical outage is going to be a phrase that gets used around our house once in a while from now on. <laughs> I think what you're saying, Jim, is that bad guys get more ink. Yeah, um, they they do get a lot of press. They got a lot of ink. There's even uh, there's something in human nature where we even kind of say, well, you know, this person is tough and ruthless, and you know, but wow, they've achieved this or that or the other. And you know, my response to that would be, you know, so what? If you've got to grind people into the dirt and you know play uh, turf battles and you know silo wars inside of the organization, all this stuff to get there. Uh, you know, you're paying too high a price personally, and, and this is where these ethical outages come from. I mean, we have worked with organizations where they've made really bad decisions, and you go in and you start interviewing people, and you find out there were 50 people that knew this was a bad decision. 
but we really hadn't created an organization where truth was primary. We penalized in this organization, uh, we find ourselves penalizing people for telling the truth rather than for not telling the truth. I think great organizations, both ethically and performance-wise, um, will penalize people for not telling the truth, and you end up clearing out this thing, you know, an Enron or a WorldCom, uh, these kinds of things, uh, you know, don't just happen overnight. These are a long accumulation of really bad everyday ethics that finally just snowball into a big giant collapse. And then you have that, not an energy outage, but you have an ethical outage. There seems to be a lot of, yes, seems to be a lot of CYA going on in organizations. <laughs> yeah, there there is. And, uh, you know, it's just an amazing thing that... Um, uh, you can have that kind of uh, burying. And, you know, CYA, uh, we, we like to tell people that uh, we want to give them a different way of thinking about CYA, not cover your assets, but uh, challenge your assumptions. Challenge your assumptions about what's going to work in your life and your career and in the work that you're doing and get away from that. But I agree with you, Daryl. I mean, CYA is one of the great organizational games played not just in America but around the world. Um, and it's it's not cute and it's not fun, and it really is pretty ugly the way it plays out in the long run. You know, one of the things I think anybody who's either at the start of their career, middle, or even far, far advanced in their career, you know, if you have everyday ethics, if you're focused on the right things and you're eliminating uh, nonsense and you're telling the truth and you're making sure that you're really trying to align with both internal and external realities about you know, I, why people are coming to work for you or not or whatever it might be. I mean, you're going to end up annoying some people, uh, you know, uh, because a lot of people want that comfort zone. Uh, yeah. But I, I think, you know, to get out of that comfort zone and share it in the long run, I think you're really going to be honored for that. Uh, we like to say to people, though, you've got to say the truth in such a way that people can hear it. Uh, so the kind of a little expression we like to encourage people to do is be clear and be kind. You know, if I'm just clear but I'm not kind, I just, I'm a hammer and people have a hard time listening to me. Uh, if I'm just kind but not clear, uh, you know, then you end up in the spin room where you're not uh, telling the truth, but you're trying to position what you're saying so that nobody gets hurt or whatever it might be. So I think it's a very critical thing to tell the truth, to tell it as soon as you know the truth but to take enough time to think about how do I share this in a clear and kind way. And a lot of people think it's one or the other, that you cannot tell the truth and be kind at once. Yeah, you, you really can't. I see people trying to worry so much about how they're going to say it that when it finally comes out, you know, you could think that you're giving somebody a disciplinary interview, and if you are too much on the kind side, they could come out thinking they've been promoted. <laughs> uh on the, on the other side of the coin, though, you could be dealing with a fellow employee or a, a subordinate uh, on a very minor issue, and if you're not kind in the way you share that, you can end up just demolishing them and, you know, really uh, really hurting their ability to move forward with their life and career. So it, it is really easy to jump on one side or the other. We can use personality as an excuse. You know, I'm just a blunt person or I'm just a really nice person. But the fact of the matter is is that high-performance ethics leaders uh, – People that really want to advance in their careers find a way to be clear and be kind. How do you reward employees for telling the truth? <laughs> you know, I think that uh, – let me just give you one example. You know, uh, I love to ask when I'm speaking to groups, um, you know, how many of you have learned more from your mistakes uh, than from your successes? You know, everybody raises their hand. And then I ask, well, why did mistakes get such a bad reputation inside of organizations? So if you had somebody that you were that, that was working for you, and um, you know they made a mistake, uh, you worked with them on it. Instead of chastising them in front of other people, you know, sort of condemning them publicly, you come into a meeting and you say to the rest of the team that you know Bill or Susan here, you know, they tried this thing. I'm really proud of them that they tried it. Didn't quite work out the way we thought, uh, but uh, I was just so proud of them for trying this. And there's four things we learned from this that we wouldn't have learned if they hadn't tried it. And now Bill or Susan are here to share this with all of you. Uh, and now you make talking about mistakes not just uh, a, an okay thing but an honorable thing. And now you've got an organization or a team where you're going to learn things and be able to share things and grow based on what you know that other people just can't. That truth is powerful and will lead to greater performance. But usually what happens, of course, is people uh, – and this is why people there will play that CYA – they make a mistake and they get abused in a meeting or they get beat up in a meeting. 
And, you know, then it's like, okay, I'm not stupid. I'm never going to do that again. That didn't work too well. And, uh, boy, if you go the other way, though, and you make it a safe place for dangerous truth, you make it a safe place to talk about those things that are a little bit scary, a little bit different, a little bit out of the box, uh, you're going to have not only that everyday ethics thing, but you're going to have uh, just a higher level of performance because people aren't spending their time on CYA. They're spending their energies uh, on trying to make things better. And human beings make mistakes. We're frail. We're fragile. But we're working together to make it better. I love the picture Jim painted. Once upon a time, many years ago, my boss's boss asked me to do something that was wrong. But his crimes go was more on the order of stealing a few grapes from the grocery store, as I mentioned earlier. Still, I declined, and my immediate boss was furious. He said I was going to be on our boss's boss's list. And I thought to myself, no, he's going to be on mine. Now, obviously, you have to be willing to lose your job over this kind of thing, which I eventually did. And I'm curious what my guest, Jim Lucas, has to say about my behavior. (laughs) Jim is the author of (laughs) High Performance Ethics, 10 Timeless Principles for Next Generation leadership. Isn't that the truth, Jim? To do the right thing, you have to be willing to lose your job over it. Yeah, there really is a risk. And of course, your story you just shared, Maureen, is another one of the reasons why we at Lumen International love uh, Maureen and the career (laughs) clinic and all the work that you do. Because you are not only willing to stand up and, and do the right thing, but you're willing to be honest and share and talk about it. So we love that. You know, I think that life is a risk. Uh, I think everything is a risk. You know, there's people that have gone to work for very large organizations thinking, well, that's going to be safer than working for a small organization. And then the company comes along and lays off 10,000 people, and the CEO says, whoops, you know, and you go from there. So, I mean, there really is nothing where you can say, I'm totally safe, even if I play that CYA, even if I don't do the right thing. And so the risk is there anyway, and I think the greater long-term risk to yourself and to your career is to not do what you did, because then maybe you protect yourself a little bit in the short run, but you've now chosen to become the kind of person that is going to be easier on compromise in the future. And as you continue to do that, you become known as a person who's willing to cut corners and not speak up and not do the right thing. And then you sort of attract more people like that around you. And it's just a really bad path to go down. It's a short-term gain, but a long-term loss. So I think the risk of uh, losing your job is there. It certainly is. If you Uh, stand up and do the right thing in a group that doesn't want to hear it and doesn't want to do it. But the risks to yourself are even greater, and frankly, even the risk to your career in the long term. Uh, I'd rather, uh, there was one candidate many years ago who said, I'd rather be right than be president, and I wish we had more politicians like that, uh, (laughs) because doing the right thing, I think, really takes you in a a much better place and much greater success in the long term. So you have to to risk losing your job. You have to risk annoying people. Uh, because doing the right thing sometimes is frustrating because it doesn't seem to be the direction we're going in. You you know what the really funny thing about this was, Jim? When the boss's boss first came to our place of employment, he sat everybody down and said he doesn't want people who tell him what they think he wants to hear. He wants the truth. And, Mm -hmm. you know, two weeks in, you thought, no, he doesn't. (laughs) He's lying about that. (laughs) It reminds you of that Nicholson Cruz interchange where Cruz says, I want the truth, and Nicholson says, You can't handle the truth. Yes. <laughs> you know, it's like, I don't think uh, I- I'm really up for this. And, you know, ultimately, I mean, when we consult with organizations and work with people that are in really deep waters, you find a lot of the times, Maureen, it's the fact that you created this culture that is very non ethical, very non oriented towards the truth, very oriented towards uh, the wrong kinds of ambitions and so on. And, you know, they've just dug their own grave. It wasn't really even a marketplace failure or a customer failure. It was just uh, an internal, you know, it was, not, it was not organizational death by homicide. It was by suicide. You know, we took ourselves out because of this horrible stuff that we've got going on inside. And uh, so, you know, the, the big things, uh, you know, not, not stealing and robbing and killing, obviously that's part of ethics. But I think it's that everyday ethics, the things that we talk about in High Performance Ethics, the book, uh, that really let people build a culture, build a team, and build a personal uh, orientation towards life and work uh, that prevents the big things when they come along from seeming like they're attractive. It's like, wait a minute, that is so far away from my grid, just forget it. 